Welcome to the Relate Church Podcast. We are a few weeks deep into a conversation around Sabbath, around the gift and the practice of Sabbath. And today I want to talk about Sabbath as resistance. Uh, We're going to talk about the rest that we are invited to experience in God and how that rest is actually a resistance. I will just revisit a little bit. If you happen to be just joining us today for the first time or maybe you've been away on holidays, we love that so much. But we have been talking about this practice. And Sabbath is uh, a word that it comes from the Hebrew word Shabbat, which means to stop. It is also understood to mean to rest, to delight, to worship. To Sabbath is to stop to rest, delight, and worship. And last week, we focused on that first thing, stopping, to just stop. And I encouraged us all as a community to make some time, to carve out time this week to stop, to just stop, to to rest from the work, from the constant go, go, go of this life, to delight in God, to just be. And so today, as I said, what I would love to focus on is rest. Before we talk about the gift of rest or the practice of rest, I do want to begin by kind of um, making a, a, a confession, maybe. I know that because I often talk about the gift of a slowed down spirituality, about the revelation that Sabbath has been to me and to our family, to our church, I talk often about um, experiencing a bit of a a more contemplative life with Jesus. I talk about it a lot, but I want to tell you that I am, for the record, a Martha. Hardcore. If you had to contrast Martha and Mary, if you're familiar with that story of two women spending time with Jesus, I am team Martha by nature. Any other Marthas in the room? I love a to-do list so much. My phone is full of them. I have a to-do list for what I need to do at home, what I need to do at work, what I need to do in all areas of my life, a grocery list. And it, is, uh, it brings me a particular kind of joy to not only make a list, but to cross things off. I am that person. I will do something that I forgot to put on my list and I'll add it afterwards just so that I can cross it off because I did that thing. I love it so much. I enjoy work. I love getting things done. I am and have been, in, or I won't say I am, I have been very much addicted to productivity, to getting things done. It brings me joy. And I am confessing this because not only have I embraced that as a way of life, I would say that for most of my life, I've kind of idolized feeling like I am getting things done, being incessantly productive. And I have not only embraced it for me personally, but I have also in some areas become a bit of a taskmaster where I am expecting it of others. I confess this because it is a way that I think that sometimes Jesus has to arrest me and change my my perspective, change my point of view through his word so that I see what is even better than feeling like I'm getting things done. I am most definitely the person who, if there are things that are happening and work to be done and you are just standing by and chatting, I will smile at you kindly, but I am (laughs) silently judging you. I just want to tell you. (laughs) Some of you know exactly what I'm talking about because you too value the work and getting stuff done. I am team Martha. I know what it is to feel guilty resting, even if nobody knows that I'm taking a nap. I know, and so it messes with me. I am learning to just be when Jesus is near. I am learning to practice what it is to sit at Jesus' feet. If Jesus is near, just give me Jesus. You can take the rest of the stuff, the lists, the accomplishments, the accumulation 
I would trade all of it for Jesus. But that is a choice and it is a practice because of the way that we think, and because of the world that we live in. I am learning the value of rest. And I want this not only for me, but for us as a church community. I want to stop for just a moment. I actually have a question to ask you, and I want to give you an opportunity maybe to think about this and then ask the person next to you just for a moment. I am curious how you would answer this. When is the last time you remember feeling truly, deeply rested? Think about that. Turn to your neighbor. Go ahead and answer that question. When is the last time you felt deeply rested? Okay, be honest, how many of you said this morning you had the best sleep of your, your night, your life last night? Yes, I love that for you. Amazing. How many of you can't remember the last time you really felt rested? Okay. Yeah. Two hands over here. Okay, well, it's worth considering. What I'd love to do today is I have a key scripture as we always do, but I have two different versions of it. And so we're going to read through these and it's kind of like a game at the same time of, of spotting the difference. You may or may not know that in scripture there are two descriptions of the Ten Commandments. They're given twice. And this commandment, this invitation and command to rest is given two times in the Bible, both in Exodus and in Deuteronomy. And so as I read through these, let's look and listen and see if we can spot the differences because there are a couple of key uh, changes between the two. They're almost identical, but slightly different. Exodus chapter 20, beginning in verse 8, tells us, Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you, nor your son or daughter, nor your male or female servant, nor your animals, nor any foreigner residing in your towns. For, for in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them, but he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Then if you turn... Uh, a few books into Deuteronomy. Again, we have the commandments, and here it says this in Deuteronomy chapter 5, beginning in verse 12. Observe the Sabbath day by keeping it holy, as the Lord your God has commanded you. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you nor your son or daughter, nor your male or female servant, nor your ox, your donkey, or any of your animals, nor any foreigner residing in your town, so that your male and female servants may rest as you do. Remember that you were slaves in Egypt, and that the Lord your God brought you out of there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord your God has commanded you to observe the Sabbath day. Two different versions here. They are given to God's people 40 years apart. The first version in Exodus, this is given at Mount Sinai as God's people had just left Egypt. And then the second version that we just read from Deuteronomy, this was given to God's people about 40 years later, a generation later, and it is given to them at the Jordan River as they are just about to cross over into the Promised Land. The first version, I'm just going to tell you the answers. Um, The first version you might have picked out, it tells us to remember the Sabbath. And the second tells us to observe the Sabbath. The remember here, it is a remembering that speaks of recalling or bringing to mind, to remember, to to bring to mind um, the Sabbath day. And then in the second version, it tells us to observe the Sabbath. And this 
is the word shamir in Hebrew, which is an, a, an observation. It is to keep, to guard, or to watch over in the same way that you would observe a holy day or a holiday like Christmas or Easter. You, ob you observe it. You keep guard over it. You watch it so that that special set-apart day doesn't become like all the rest of the days. Uh, a, a slight difference there. We are to keep watch over or to observe the Sabbath, lest it become just another ordinary day, just another day during the week. And that is why there's the two different words there, both remember and observe. Traditionally, when the, the Sabbath begins, there is the lighting of the two candles and a remembrance. You say, remember and observe, because it is a way of honoring the instruction that God has given as you light the two candles. So they begin a little differently, but then they both end slightly differently. You might have picked up that there's a slight variation there. So in the first version, it tells us, for in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, but he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. That is Exodus. And then when we turn over to Deuteronomy, it ends by telling us to remember that you were slaves in Egypt and that the Lord your God brought you out of there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord your God has commanded you to observe the Sabbath day. The first version anchors Sabbath in creation. We talked about this last week, how God as he, he brought the Sabbath into being, he started a pattern. There was a, a, a tradition of honoring that Sabbath. There was a rhythm that God began and that then as we look back to creation, we continue as his people. It anchors it in creation. So we uh, imitate God's divine example and as we do, there is a blessing there. God blessed that Sabbath day. Deuteronomy, then, it anchors the Sabbath in freedom. Look back and remember that you were in bondage, that you were enslaved. And so now there is a freedom that we are to walk in, no longer <coughs> slaves. And that is a different remembering as then we observe the Sabbath as we are commanded to. One is an invitation and the other is a warning. One uh, causes us to look back at the way God set things in motion, and the other is a warning that if we do not observe the Sabbath, that there is a consequence for us. The first is about living in rhythm with the creation that God has made, and the second is about a resistance to the overpowering tyranny of slavery to remember and not go back there again. Sabbath is resistance. When we read this, we remember um, that this comes out of a very real story and a very real situation. Egypt was a real empire. Pharaoh was a real ruler, uh, a dictator. And when you read through the, the scripture, you see how Egypt, or like Babylon, they are examples of, or they are um, a way of illustrating uh, a, a controlling and dominating uh, force on the people. And we no longer live in those circumstances. Many people do today continue to live in very real slavery. We live in a land, in a place, in a time, in a culture where the controlling, domineering um, force that has power over us looks different. It is a culture that dominates, that works to control our attention, to grab our, our affection, that would shape us into something other than what God has called us to live in and walk in and rest in and delight in and worship in. Today in our Western culture, 
that dominating control looks different, but it is very real. It is there. We exist in a culture of always needing more, of always feeling like it is never enough. We're never enough. We don't have enough stuff. There is a control that is exerted over us. We live in a culture, as we've talked about, that causes us to feel restless, that it's always on. We're always connected. There's, there's noise that surrounds us. And so we find ourselves accumulating more, but never having enough, achieving more, but never being enough. And this culture that is dominant, it produces within people, us included, if we are not awake and aware and wise to God's ways and his kingdom, it breeds within us a restlessness. And what we're pointing out today is that to live chronically restless, chronically exhausted, is to live enslaved, yeah. is to live with a taskmaster lording over us. And then we remember and we celebrate that Jesus' invitation to his people is rest. 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 Not just for your body, but rest for your soul. A trust in him that it's going to be okay. And maybe you need to hear that today. It's, it's, it's going to be okay. Perhaps you are in the middle of a storm that is noisier than the one we, we all experienced last night. Maybe life is raging. Maybe life in your family or just trying to work out the way through your circumstances when it comes to work, career. Perhaps you are dealing with a storm in your physical body or in your mind that feels like it's raging and out of control. Jesus' promise, his invitation is rest, even as you walk through the valley of the shadow of death. It's going to be okay. I'm reminded of um, Dallas Willard when he was asked to describe Jesus in one word. He said relaxed. He's relaxed. That messes with me in the best way. That we have a relaxed king who is in control and that is the God that we follow and so then to enter into his rest is to live as his kingdom people Deuteronomy warns us remember that you were slaves in Egypt and that the Lord your God brought you out of there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm remember that you too were once enslaved where you had no choice but to work and work and work and not stop. Slaves in this economy, in, in any uh, economy, they, they are seen as only valuable when they produced something valuable. And just saying those words, just thinking about what that means and what that looks like causes my heart to break because that is never God's intention for his beloved creation, for the humans like you and I that he made with purpose, with value, just inherent value. And we see how much Jesus values us because of the great lengths that he went to free his people. You too, you once lived under the dominating influence of a cruel taskmaster. Yeah. And so, Sabbath is a refusal to go back to Egypt. Practicing the way which we have referenced and we're borrowing heavily from this organization that helps churches and, and Jesus people better understand the practices of following Jesus. It describes Sabbath this way on, on their website. It says, Sabbath is a practice from the way of Jesus by which we war against the cancerous restlessness of our age and instead take on the easy yoke of Jesus, our rabbi, to find rest for our souls. 
here today, we don't, we don't live physically enslaved, but we live in a system that dominates and overpowers, that preaches condemnation to us, that will have us believe that we can't unplug, that we cannot stop, that there is always more to be done, more to earn, more to accumulate. And I want to remind us all today that God went to extreme measures to free us of that regime. Yeah. Yeah. He drowned the taskmasters. Yeah. Think back to God freeing his people and how he's freed us today. He has done the thing. He has brought us out. And so the invitation for all of us is to not go back. Don't go back there. Don't keep trying to earn what Jesus has already paid to provide. Do not put back on that yoke that he broke. It's not yours. It's not for you. Live in the freedom that he has provided. Pharaoh has been dealt with. This is good news. And maybe this is new news for you today. Perhaps the way that you have seen life or the way that you have been taught would cause you to think that you do need to do more, be better, earn salvation. But I want to invite us to see how that, that is the old, that Pharaoh has been dealt with, that we live in a new kingdom and we have a new king. Don't go back. Okay. So for all of us, I wonder, okay, so how do we do that? Last week we talked about just stopping, and I said start where you are. If you can't carve out a day this week, find a few hours where you can stop, unplug, turn the phone off, put it away, um, put the to-do list aside. Let the dust accumulate for a few hours. If you can, if you've got the guts, this is what I tell myself, to just stop. And today, I want to invite us to consider the rest that is part of this invitation. So Sabbath is a holy day, as we've already said. We are to observe the Sabbath and keep it holy. It is not a day off. Eugene Peterson calls a, a day off where you just catch up on all the work that you didn't get done during the week. He actually calls that a bastard Sabbath that it is the illegitimate child of what God has for us. Yeah. He said that, I didn't, but <laughs> consider how sometimes we just adopt maybe like a Sabbath-ish routine on the weekend, where maybe I'm picking up my phone less, but I'm still picking it up, where I'm doing a few things that need to be done, but also I'm, I'm enjoying some rest in the middle of it. That's okay, but there is more on offer here for us. It is not just a day off. It is also not a cheat day. It isn't the day that you just wait, and I mentioned last week how I don't count any of the calories or macros or steps or anything on the Sabbath day, but it's not a cheat day where we just like sit in bed and binge the bear and eat Cheetos or drink wine or whatever. That sounds actually quite wonderful to me, but that is not what we're talking about. That isn't what we're looking forward to here. It is so much better. It is a holy day, like Christmas every week, where there is a special day where we get to not only rest, but also delight. And we're going to talk about that next week, and I cannot even wait. Um, uh, where there are things that we get to do that, that cause delight, that bring pleasure, that God has given us as a gift. But it is a holy day. It is deliberate. It is thoughtful. It is a day to enjoy life, to say good enough, mazel tov. We'll just set aside the week so that we can be fully present to the God who is present to us and enjoy the good gifts of this life that he has provided for us. So to enter into this rest is to rest. What do we rest from? We rest from work. Not just the work that you get paid for, but all the other things that accumulate. It is a time to just set that aside for a time. We rest from worry. 
when those anxious thoughts pop up, and we'll talk about that more in a second here, where we tend to just ruminate on or focus on all the problem solving that life involves, I would encourage you to practice setting that aside for a time, to just rest in the trust that God has you. We also rest from wanting, from accumulating, from, that might mean resting from shopping, from purchasing, from um, scrolling things that you might want to purchase tomorrow, the desire for anything other than the gifts that God has already given you. We just set that aside for a time. I want to clarify that this has nothing to do with being lazy or self-indulgent. There might be some of that that is just part of delighting in life. But what it is all about is it's a a letting ourselves be human-sized and trusting that God is God-sized, is trusting in his care, his love, his attention toward us. Because it is an act of resistance, you will feel resistance. Some of you are feeling it even now as you're like, "Mm, that's good for you. I don't know if this is for me. I don't know if I can do that thing. It is an act of resistance, and it is countercultural, and it is not what is normal in the world around you, in your social circles, perhaps not in your family of origin. It, It might stir some things up. Because it is a practice of resistance, you will feel resistance both externally and internally. So externally, um, we've already addressed this, but I I want us to see how the culture around us is restless, Sabbath-less, rhythm-less, never satisfied. And so in order to Sabbath well as someone who exists within this culture, this is the world that we live in, it will require boldness and courage and some decisions ahead of time in order for you to walk this out. You will basically have to choose what you're gonna say no to in order to say yes to the good and best thing. It will take intentionality and it will take some preparation ahead of time to go against that flow. But to follow Jesus is to war against the principalities and powers of this age, of this world, that are restless that do not value a Sabbath. And be aware, there are systemic forces in our world that keep us and keep others from Sabbath rest. No question. Pay attention to the, to the messages that you hear, to the dominating voice that is around us. There are forces like, uh, that are part of the system that we exist in, whether it is racism, sexism, greed, uh, political corruption, it, it, it's there and it affects us. And they are all, all of these dark forces, they are animated by the, the prince of this world, the prince of the air, uh, the, the one who is a deceiver, who wants to corrupt, who is anti-rest. And so as we practice Sabbath and we follow in the way of Jesus, What we are doing is we are warring against those powers as we follow Jesus and we align ourselves with him. He called himself the Lord of the Sabbath. We align ourselves with him. And as we do, there is a resistance to what is going on around us. So that's like the external stuff going on. But then there is also the internal friction that happens because Egypt isn't just around us, it is also in here. It affects us from the inside. And so to rest, we have to resist those uh, dynamics of restlessness, which, which look like, yeah, the, the greed that will pop up, that we just want more, the envy of other people's lives, the discontentment, the anxiety, the addiction that comes up uh, within us. What we find is that when we quiet the outside noise, the inner critic, the inner chirping gets louder. 
it starts to speak up. And you, you'll hear, this, this is what it sounds like for me, um, as I'm, I'm deciding that I'm going to embrace rest, I'll think, um, do you know what you could be getting done today? <laughs> what about that situation at church with those people who are going through that hard thing and you haven't connected with them in, in forever? Today would be a good day. You have some time to just connect and check in, send a quick text. Not that that's a bad thing, but it will definitely pop up on Sabbath. Yeah. Or I will think, like I said, of the dust that is just piling up all over my house while I sit there. I look and I can see it. It's like on Sabbath, it just grows and it can't be ignored any longer. I'll think about the people that I should probably be reaching out to or helping, the, those good and holy things that are a gift to me. Work is a gift. But when I've decided that I'm just going to set it aside, I'll think about all the things that I need to do. There is this push and pull that is within us. And we will all feel a pull toward Jesus and his way, but we will also feel like a, a desire to, to not surrender, to not submit, to just take a moment out of the Sabbath rhythm to just maybe get one quick thing done. That will happen. I want you to be aware of it so that then we can resist. And so really practically, if you're going to carve out some time, prepare ahead of time. Go grocery shopping before. Maybe do some cooking ahead of time so that you can enjoy the time, the day. Do the dusting ahead of time, Angela. Um, if you have kids and you're like, how do we do this thing? We'll talk more about this, but how do we Sabbath as a family? My kids don't stop. I want to put my feet up, but that is impossible for me. Um, I've heard of people who buy like special Sabbath toys or activities that go in a box and they just come out on Sabbath so that everybody is excited about this day that we get to celebrate together. Think about that. What could you do to make it simpler so that you can ease into, so that you can relax on that day? Prepare practically. And then when we talk about those external things that we deal with, I would encourage you to consider what are the external voices, noises, um, distractions, uh, the things that compel you that God would have you set aside for a day. And your list might look different than mine, but maybe it is turning off the phone. Maybe it is deciding we're going to do no screens today at all, whether that be, you know, uh, the internet or TV. Maybe it's deciding ahead of time, I'm not going to be shopping on that day. I'm not going out to the mall. I'm going to just get all my groceries ahead of time. I will not be scrolling um, and looking at other stuff that day. Maybe it means saying no to social obligations ahead of time so that you just have an easy answer when stuff comes up. Sorry, I can't. That day is booked. You don't have to explain. You can. But just decide that is blocked off on my calendar. It may be that there are certain people that you have to just decide, um, I'm going to catch up with you the next day. Work, chores, errands. Consider all the things in your life and those items that would be meaningful for you to set aside in order to Sabbath well. And then internally, as I said, when you carve out some time, and it is a practice, and it takes practice, it is usually harder before it is easier. It is usually painful before it is just pure blessing. It is a blessing, but it takes some practice. And so if thoughts come up while you are Sabbathing, um, whether it be anxiety or um, shame, uh, feeling bad, guilty about resting, I would just encourage you to decide ahead of time as those thoughts come up to just bring them to God. Just bring it to God in prayer. Just present it to him. Have a conversation with him. God, this is going on. Can you join me in processing this, working through this thought, this concern, this heaviness. Um, and if you decide ahead of time that that is what we're going to do, you already have a game plan in place in order to practice it well. 
the team is going to come up and, and join me, and we'll take a moment, a few moments, to just respond to how God is leading us. I think I've been clear, but I, I want to say that I want this for you. It's not even about what I want. I believe God wants this for you and for us. Because a, a rested, restful church is a lot kinder, more compelling than one that is exhausted, with no margin, striving to earn something. It just looks different. I want this for us so much because I believe with my whole heart that it's really easy to tempt people who are weary and overstimulated and um, tired. It's just easier. It is harder to tempt people who are well rested, who are finding delight in the good life that God has provided for us. Not a perfect life, but experiencing and delighting in his goodness right here and now. It is difficult to lure people who are enjoying God's presence there's nothing like it, who are deeply grounded in the love of God. And this would be my hope and my desire for all of us, that we would be a people who we sure don't have everything figured out yet. But we have a God, the Lord of the Sabbath, who invites us, and not just invites, who commands us to trust him and rest in him. To remember that we are not a slave any longer, that Jesus is king, that he is the king who invites us to walk with him, to learn the unforced rhythms of grace. He is nothing like Pharaoh. He is not a task master. He offers us rest for our souls. And the question is, will we enter into that rest? Will we resist? Embrace Sabbath as resistance. Could you just close your eyes for a moment? would you teach us to sit when you are near, to not rush past, to not show off or try to impress, to not get busy and distracted when there is nothing better than friendship with you. Jesus, you for your kindness toward us, for your love. We don't even, we only grasp the tiniest little measure of the depth of your love for us. But when we remember the cross, we remember how you died out of love for us. We remember, Lord, how you arranged everything. You came for us, as Mark shared earlier. You came toward us. You paid for our freedom. God, we can't take that lightly, and we can't make little of it. So I pray that we would choose to make ourselves at home in that love and care. I thank you for the gift of work. Lord, that you have invited us, and called us, anointed us, and given us the privilege of adding value to this world as you lead us. 
God, our desire is to leave this city better than we found it, that it would be here within us, within our community, that it would be here in this nation as it is in heaven. Lord, only you can do that. So we surrender to your power. Would you fill us afresh again today? Strengthen us, Lord. And I pray as we choose to enter your rest, God, that you would strengthen us, that we're able to resist the work of the enemy who condemns, who accuses, who lies and distracts. Teach us, God, what is true, what is truly beautiful. And I pray that we would be alive with a joy to practice that goodness that you have provided for us. God, today as a church community, as we, as we come and receive communion, we remember that as your body was broken and your blood was shed, it was this covenant gift to us. You, Lord, say, I give you myself. And as we come to the table, we respond and we say, Lord, we give you our lives in return. We give you all of it. We give you all of it. We give you our hearts, our minds, our whole selves. Teach us what that looks like, Lord. Lord, today we receive your forgiveness. We fall short and we fail. Lord, we can't help but think about where we mess up even this week. God, I pray that as we turn to you today, we repent of working it all out on our own. We repent of our distrust of your way. Lord, we repent of where we look for satisfaction, joy, belonging, anywhere outside of you. We repent and we turn and we turn toward you today. We receive your grace, your mercy, and your forgiveness. Would you pour it out today on your church? We receive it today. God, I pray that you would continue to show us what it looks like to trust you and rest in you. May we be Sabbath people following in the way of Jesus. Thanks for listening to this week's message. If something stood out to you, if you'd like to submit a prayer request, or if you'd like to learn more about how you can get connected, email relate at relatechurch.ca. If you'd like to partner with us and our community initiatives, please visit relatechurch.ca slash give. It's been an honor to spend this time with you. Catch you next week.